Good morning, church. I, uh, uh, Todd uh, texted me last night and said, you know, what song would you like sung? You know, and almost him and I at the same time thought that last song, considering what we're talking about today. You know, I was like, wow, that's a perfect song for it. I think today we have a special one. Uh, so here in two or three weeks, I'm going to start doing a, a series of lessons on how we got the Bible. How do we have, you know, about 40 men write uh, scrolls and whatnot, and how did it get from all over the then known world, and then how did it get all combined till we got this? So I haven't written it yet, so it's going to be a four to eight classes. I'm not really sure, you know, but I thought, you know, when they asked me to preach today, I thought, what a great opportunity for me to throw out an advertisement for the class. You know, it's going to be Sunday morning, and so I want to just kind of give a little blip so that, you know, maybe you all will be interested enough to come and join us on Sunday morning for Bible class. Um, I was trying to decide what, you know, these uh, lessons to do. I didn't want to start at the beginning because I thought to myself, my paranoid self, I said, if I teach the first one the first time, then when it's time for that first class, no one's going to show up because everybody's already heard that. So I didn't want to do the last one. Because, well, who wants to hear the end of a movie? You know, you want to, you know, who wants to hear the end of the movie? And so I thought, well, I'm going to go about three-fourths the way in. So we're about three-fourths the way in, which means it's going to be a little bit rough starting, and it's going to probably be a little bit rough ending. You're probably going to have some questions, but I promise it'll be answered, you know, in, in the other classes. Um, but I'm hoping I'll answer all your questions for this part, for this part. Also, I think it's extremely important that for our faith, you know, for our individual faith, that we have confidence that we have the Word of God. Amen. When we talk to people about becoming Christians, we want to have confidence that we have the Word of God. And so, hence, I thought this would be a good lesson for today. About four, five, six months ago, I started working on this class. I'm terrible with time, passage of time, so I'm not exactly sure how long it was. And I realized I, it's just too much. It's just too much for me. It was too much Hebrew, too much Greek, you know, and whatnot. And so I had to recruit some help. So I got these two gentlemen to help me out. Now, they don't know it. I just use them as reference, you know what I mean. So um, I did a search, you know, for um, archaeologists who would be, you know, who were uh, very uh, well respected in both the religious world as well as the non-religious world, right? And so I got these two fellows. Now, I did not know it when I first got them that both of these gentlemen are actually in the Lord's Church. They are members of the Church of Christ. Uh, Dr. Neil Lightfoot, Dr. Dr. Neil Lightfoot actually taught at Abilene Christian University. That's where I went. Um, I was actually going to school there while he was a teacher there, a professor there, and I never saw him. I, I was a fallen Christian then, and so I missed an opportunity, and he passed away around 2012. Uh, Dr. Dan Owen uh, is a uh, professor at a uh, Church of Christ Bible School and uh, also is the um, minister, of, uh, possibly, I didn't get a chance to call and ask, uh, of uh, a minister at my uh, stepbrother and stepsister's uh, church. So, but I'm not sure on that 100%, I just think so. So, um, so just, to, just so I don't have pride and I'll get prideful, I just quickly wanna tell you all the arrangement, you know, who did what, okay, for, the, for, this for this class. So Dr. Neil Lightfoot and Dr. Dan Owen, they both probably took about six years to get their PhDs to become doctors. Then they each spent about 40, 45 years studying this class, you know, investigating the manuscripts over in the Bible lands and all that stuff, you know, and, and, uh, and then my part of this is, well, I, I made the PowerPoint. So <laughs> just so we know, <laughs> all right? So uh, let's start, all right? So on the left, okay, it's left for y'all too. <laughs> on the left, is um, the uh, Gospel of John, okay? It's an authentic manuscript. Uh, it's from about 200 AD. Both of the doctors that I mentioned before, both 
investigate, you know, or research this, or uh, what do you call it? You know, they went and they looked at this and, they, and you know, and, uh, and this has been uh, authentic. This is an authentic manuscript. And uh, now the one on the right, all right, that was uh, uh, authenticated by one professor at Harvard. So the one on the left, like I said, is the Gospel of John. The one on the right is the Gospel of Jesus' wife. So, why is this one in our Bible, but that one's not in our Bible? Hmm. Oh, if I ask questions, it's rhetorical, just so you know. So, why is the one on the left in the Bible and the one on the right is not in the Bible? Well, that's what we're going to learn today. Which books belong in the New Testament? Can we have confidence in it? There's 27 books in the New Testament. Are we sure that maybe it's not supposed to be 28, 29? Are we sure it's really 27, not 26, 25? Well, that's what we're going to look for today. So the first rule that we have to establish to ourselves, and this is something we have to remember, the canonicity of the New Testament books rests upon the identity of Jesus. Of Jesus. I want you all to remember that. Every Lord's Day, Sunday, we take communion. We just did. We just did. It's Lord's Day because that's the day that Jesus rose from the dead, which was on a Sunday. Now, if you believe that Jesus was bodily resurrected, and I assume that if you took the Lord's Supper, you do believe that, then you believe that Jesus is God become flesh, that he is the only begotten Son of God, then you are going to accept that the canonicity of the books of the New Testament are true. And I'm gonna explain why, okay? In John 13 through 18, John chapters 13 through 18, is a lengthy conversation between Jesus and his 12 apostles at the Last Supper. In John 13, 2, it tells that it was during the Lord's Supper. See, so in John chapter 3, 12, during this Lord's Supper, right? So we see in, uh, that it was during the Lord's Supper. And, but then in John 18, 1, we see that they, you know, they got up and left. So everything from John 13, 2 to John 18, 1 is a long conversation between Jesus and the 12 apostles, okay? Now, early, now in chapter 13, about halfway through, remember Judas, he got up and left, right? Because he was going to portray Jesus, right? So now that leaves Jesus with the 11 apostles, and Jesus is talking about the special ministry of these apostles. He's talking about the apostles that he, he is going to send out like God sent him. Okay. So this is Jesus talking about the apostles. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. So, to put this verse simply, God sent Christ, Christ sent the apostles. To receive the apostles is to receive Christ. To receive Christ is to receive God. All right? So, now a little bit later in John chapter 17, still in this very long discussion, they're still in this long conversation with the 11 apostles. Remember, Judas had already left. Jesus prays for the apostles and their appear in their presence. And so I'm getting into, you'll see it, verse 6. But, you know, Jesus started the prayer a little bit earlier in this. You know, so picking up in the middle of the prayer, um, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. So, uh, so uh, when we get down to verse 20, we see that uh, how do we believe in Jesus? How do we believe in Jesus? Well, John 17, 20, you know, I do not ask for these only, 
but also for those who will believe in me through their word. You see, how do we believe in Jesus? We believe it through their word. Jesus didn't write any of the Bible. Jesus didn't write any of the Bible, right? If everything was written about Jesus, remember the passage? If, anything that, if everything that was written about Jesus was written, the books would go up to the clouds, right? But Jesus never wrote any of the books. So we would believe in Jesus by the words of the apostles. A little bit later, uh, after the resurrection, so now this is after the resurrection, Jesus appears to the apostles, okay? So, and Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. So we can kind of look at it this way. Jesus is God's apostle because God sent Jesus with a message. And the 12 apostles, because remember, Matthias joins in Acts 1, where Jesus is apostles because he sent them out with a message. So to accept the teachings of the apostles is to accept Jesus. To accept Jesus is to accept the Father, All right? So let's take a quick look at the scripture that tells us that the apostles were given this task, All right? Uh, Matthew 16, I will give you the keys. Now, so now remember, this is Jesus who is talking to Peter, okay? So this one here is Jesus talking to Peter. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So here we see Jesus talking to Peter. And look what he says. You know, he says that, hey, you know, you have authority. You have authority. Now, let's see what Jesus says to the rest of the apostles. So we skip over a couple chapters, right? And now this is Jesus talking to all the apostles, okay? Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So in other words, Jesus is saying that the apostles are his spokesmen, his spokesmen. Whatever I decree in heaven, you're going to tell the people on earth. The apostles are the ambassadors. So, uh, so here's Jesus speaking uh, with the 11 apostles, okay? Um, uh, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to you remembrance all that I have said to you. And they are all in a room. You remember in, in, uh, in, in Acts, you know, they're all in a room, you know, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit falls on them, you know, like tongues of fire. Do you remember that? And remember they went out to, to you know, and they were speaking in unknown langu uh, in, in languages that they didn't know and people heard them. You know, you know, and they, they say there's about 15 different languages there and they're just talking and they're talking and everybody understands them, right? And so, um, um, uh, and then, in, uh, you know, and then in Acts 2, right after that, Peter gives the first gospel sermon and 3,000 were baptized into Christ. Uh, John 16, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. You know, so again, this is Jesus talking to apostles again. He will guide you in all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you things that are to come. So why? So, so then, so remember, so 3,000 get baptized, right? So we have 3,000 baptized, and then, and then right after that, see, this is right after that, Acts 2.42 See, and they were devoted themselves, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Now, why were they so focused on following the apostles' teaching? Because Jesus said that the apostles would get the Holy Spirit, and the people understood that the apostles were Jesus' ambassadors. They were the spokesmen. In 2 Thessalonians 2.15, uh, So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. You see? So the early Christians, uh, the early Christians who believed in the risen Jesus saw that Jesus had chosen these men. They had received the Holy Spirit and that they were prophets of God, they were apostles. 
And they're saying, you know, either by their spoken word, right, which is what I'm doing now, you know, speaking their words, or by their letter when you're reading them. So here comes a principle that applies to both the Old Testament and the New Testament. So when we do our first class in a couple weeks, you're going to see this principle often, right? When Paul wrote the Ephesians, he said, oh, sorry, hold on, the camp prison, the canical principle. When the people of God universally accepted a person as a prophet of God, they immediately and automatically accepted the writings of that person as holy scripture. I want to read that one more time. When the people of God universally accepted a person as a prophet of God, they immediately and automatically accepted the writings of that person as Holy Scripture. Now, I see a couple of people taking pictures, and I really uh, I encourage it, but I'm thinking about that. There's a lot of information in here. Um, so what I'll do is I will, um, uh, today, I'll put it on the uh, Church of Christ you know, uh, Facebook page, along with my notes. That way it's a reference if anybody ever needs it, or anybody not here. Um, so, so when Paul wrote the Ephesians, he says this to the Ephesians. He says this to the Ephesians. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. You see, notice that boldest section. All, okay, so let's understand this. All the apostles were prophets, which means that the apostles spoke divine inspiration from the Holy Spirit. But not all prophets were apostles, okay? Now, there were other men that the apostles laid hands on, and they got the power to prophesy also because they spoke by divine inspiration. So, how did the first century dis uh, church distinguish from truth? And from air, right? Well, whoever listened, so let me read this. Uh, 1 John 4, 6, we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of air. You see how this is a test? It's a test, you see? You know, whoever knows God and listens to us you know, uh, you know, we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. So if if you're from God, you know, if you're if you're not a false teacher, you're going to listen to the apostles' teaching. So, um, so how did the first century church distinguish from truth and from error? Well, whoever listened to the apostles' teaching were teaching truth. Whoever didn't listen to the apostles' teaching were not of truth. Remember, the apostles had authority. They had been with Jesus his whole ministry. They had been promised the Holy Spirit, and the people saw them get it, right? Saw them speaking fluently in foreign languages. The people saw and knew that the apostles were divinely invested in prophecy. Now, I want to give you an example of the apostles laying hands on other men and the, and the power of that prophecy. Um, the, the Holy Spirit... Okay, the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, says this. All Scripture, not some Scripture, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, says that all Scripture. Um, so here we see in 1 Timothy, Okay, so look at this, right? I was talking about men who are not apostles, right? So here we see in 1 Timothy 5.18, right? For the scripture says, now you notice I bolded that, and there's a reason. For the scripture says, so he's saying whatever this is a scripture, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Okay, that's from Deuteronomy. Okay, that's from Deuteronomy. Which in in a previous an earlier class, which is going to be in the future, because you know how this is, right? So in the future first class, you know we're going to talk about that. We're going to see that Deuteronomy is scripture, okay? It's God's word. So here we see that that um, in First Timothy, 
uh, Paul is quoting from Scripture. He quotes Deuteronomy. Now look, and the laborer deserves his wages. So whatever that is, is also Scripture. Do you follow me? For the Scripture says, okay, what follows this is a Scripture. For the Scripture says, what follows the Scripture? Deuteronomy and then Luke. That is a quote from Luke. See, so the first half is Deuteronomy, and the second half is from Luke, and Paul equates them. He says they're both scripture, you see? We see the Holy Spirit through God quoted Luke and calls it scripture, and Paul already said that, um, that Luke, so Paul's saying that Luke is holy scripture, right? Now, so isn't that interesting? Now, so Luke, wasn't an apostle, right? But but he was but he was given he was given the power of prophecy by the apostles. So now I'm sure that you heard other religions or people say that Paul's letters are not scripture, or they're part scripture, or they're sexist, or whatever, right? You know, the whole religions will not read anything from Paul. They will say it's not scripture, all right? But what does Peter, what does Peter say about Paul's words, his letters? Second Peter 3. So this Peter talking. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul uh -huh, also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters, when he speaks in them on these matters. There are some things in, in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You see that? So here we have scripture talking about this, you know, this whole chapter here is talking about the second coming of Christ. And here we have Peter talking about Paul and who gave him that wisdom? Who gave Paul that wisdom? Does Peter say God? God gave him that wisdom, right? Notice that Peter already recognized, recognizes that Paul has many letters, see, in all his letters. See, in all his letters. Notice, notice this also. As they do the other scriptures. So Peter is calling Paul's letters, plural, letters, Scripture. He's calling him Holy Scripture. So Peter is calling Paul's letters Holy Scripture, and Paul is calling Luke's letters Holy Scripture. You see how the canonization is already kind of taking place? You see? You know, notice that when uh, the next slide, the people of God, again, this principle, the people of God universally accepted a person as a prophet of God. They immediately and automatically accepted the reigns of that person as holy scripture. So now how did they get all these letters? How did they get all these letters? Well, let's explore that for a bit. It was much the same way as the Old Testament. It's much the same way as the Old Testament was collected. Um, but this verse in Colossians, I think, gives us an insight into how they collected the scrolls. So let's take a look at that. Colossians 4.16 and when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. Oh, so here we see we're talking about two. Sorry. Two. We're talking about two, right, scriptures. Okay, here. We're talking one that, you know, uh, is the letter being read among you, and also the one from Laodicea. So when Paul wrote the Colossians, when Paul wrote the Colossians, we see that the letter in Colossians 2.1 was also important to Laodicea. I didn't put that verse down, uh, but yeah. So in Colossians 2.1, you know, we also see that, the, that the, the book of Colossians was important to Laodicea. And there were three little towns in the area. See, there are three little towns in that area, right? And notice here, it doesn't say to Laodicea. Notice it doesn't say to Laodicea. It says from Laodicea. Now, most of your experts agree that that is the book of Ephesians. Ephesians. So Paul writes to Colossae 
and there are two other major towns nearby. And he's basically saying to pass these letters back and forth, right, in the scripture. Pass these letters back and forth. Now, the natural thing to do would be, if you got these letters, is to make a copy. You know, because otherwise, you read it, and then it's gone. You know, well, that, that's not, you know, you're going to make a copy. So, so, uh, so the natural thing to do was to make a copy to keep. So already these churches have some scrolls. Uh, so already these churches have some scrolls to add to their scroll boxes. Okay? And when they would hear of a scroll in Rome, let's say, right? Well, they wanted a copy of that. Right? And when they heard of a scroll in Philippi, well, they wanted a copy of that. Right? And eventually, everyone had a large collection of Old Testament and New Testament scrolls in their scroll box. Um, so, you know, back then, obviously, people didn't have their own Bibles. They didn't have their own Bibles. So the, the scrolls were kept in a box in the front of the church. So what they would do is they would have a box, okay, with all the scrolls in it. Let's go. That's going to advance 10 frames or something. Okay, so here we can see this, this, this box, okay? So what they would do is they would have a box with all those scrolls, and they would have an attendant. And when it was your turn to read the scripture, you would get up, and the attendant would give you the scroll that you had to read from, and then you would open it up, you would find where you need to read, and you would read it. But here's the crazy thing, right? Here's the crazy thing, right? Until 1500s, there was no chapters and verses. You know, there was no chapters and verses. So imagine being given a scroll. Oh, you'll see here in a second. <laughs> so here we have, um, why is my note not coming up? Yep, you saw a blip. <laughs> And he, um, so, uh, and he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. Well, this time about Jesus. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. Okay? And he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. Okay? Now watch this. This is an original scroll of Isaiah. All right, this is from the uh, second century, you know. So imagine being given this, okay? Imagine being given this. There's no chapters, there's no verses, and you gotta find the passage. You think we have it hard today? <laughs> Nowadays, we can put our cell phone and, you know, do a word search, and I mean, how long will it take you to tell you how many times in the Bible is angels mentioned? You know, 10 seconds, you can know that answer, but imagine this. Right? Look, look at this scroll. Now, you, they say, okay, we want you to read chapter 61. Well, wait, do I go left or do I go right? You know, because you only have the words. You see that? You only have the words. So let's read the, the bottom one, the verse 20. And, and Jesus rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. All right? So imagine, you open, you have this huge scroll, you know, and you got to find chapter 61. But you only know the words. And you have to know, do I go left, do I go right? Do I... Jesus knew scripture. I am more than confident, as I'm sure you all are too, that he had no problem going straight to the verse. So, uh, around 70, 170 AD, around 170 AD, Justin Martyr, who was a writer in Rome, was trying to explain to the Emperor uh, Pius uh, who, uh, who Christians were and how they worshipped all around the world uh, and, that they were, uh, and that there was no need to murder us. There was no need to murder Christians. They were no threat. They were no threat. See, he's trying to appeal to him, appeal to him. So he's explaining what all Christians did in their worship. And this is what he wrote, right? This is what he wrote. And on the day called Sunday, all who live in the cities or in the country gathered together in one place 
and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read as long as time permits. You see that? Notice what they read in, read in worship. What do they read in worship? They, the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets. Ephesians 3, 5, which was not made known to the sons of men and other generations, it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So who were they reading in worship? Who were they reading in worship? They were reading the writings of the apostles, like Peter and Paul, and the prophets, like Mark and Luke. You see that? All apostles are prophets, but not all prophets are apostles. But they were all inspired by God. When the people of God universally accepted a person as a prophet of God, they immediately and automatically accepted the writings of that person as holy scripture. Remember that. So now, in the late second century, early third century, early Christians got challenged. Heretics arose. A heretic is a person who starts teaching things that are in opposition to what Jesus and the apostles taught. Okay, that's a heretic, a false teacher. A heretic is a false teacher, okay? Um, remember what the scripture told us. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and spirit of, e of error. So a heretic is a false teacher, a false prophet. So here we see uh, some famous heretics. Cerinthius, Basilius, Valentinus. See, I, 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 I act like if I say fast enough, you all won't hear that I'm saying it kind of wrong, right? And, and last one, Marcion. Now, I'm going to talk about that Marcion a little bit, okay? So Marcion of Pont Pontus was a very wealthy man. His father was a wealthy ship, shipbuilder on the Black Sea. And uh, so Marcion taught that none of the Old Testament was scripture, none of the Old Testament was true, and that the only books in the New Testament that were true were Luke and 10 of the books of Paul, and that's it. Now remember, the Christians had just accepted these books of scripture and had for hundreds of years at this point, almost 400 years at this point, Right? Uh, and uh, so, so uh, and here, Marcion rose up very powerfully with lots of money, with lots of power, right? And lots of friends. And says that the Old Testament is not scripture and that only Luke and 10 of Paul's books were scripture. And the church said, what, what? What is this guy talking about? What is this guy talking about? So the church rose up to defend those scriptures, right? They rose up to defend those scriptures that they had already accepted. And that is where we get the great councils, like the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, where the books were defended and why they were always considered scripture. They said, hey, these are always considered scripture and here's why, right? Um, and that is where some people get the idea that in 381 that the people the, um, came up with the books in the Bible. I'm sure everybody here has heard of it. In fact, sometimes when I've mentioned I was going to teach this class, people say, oh yeah, yeah, the Catholic, the Catholic Church gave us the Bible, right? No, they did not at all, okay? All they did is they, they, uh, they just said, here is why this is scripture. This is why. Nothing was added. Nothing was taken away. You see? They were just defending it. All right? What, what happened? Hey. Hmm. So, for example, the book of James. It was argued that it was not scripture because it quoted the book of First Enoch and the assumption of Moses. And that may raise a few questions, right? 
But if you take the canon, the canonical principle, which I've already showed you that slide probably three times now, right? If you take that principle, James was one of the brothers of Jesus. So first of all, it's one of Jesus' brothers, okay? He was an inspired apostle. He was an apostle. The risen Jesus had appeared to him after he was resurrected. And so the book of James was accepted because of the canonical principle, whereas some books were never accepted. Oops. For example, just a couple. I just read a couple. The Acts of Paul. Well, why wasn't that accepted? Because it wasn't written by Paul. The Apocalypse of Peter. Well, why wasn't that accepted? Because it wasn't written by Peter. Well, how about the Epistle of Barnabas? Why wasn't that accepted? Because it wasn't written by Barnabas. See? The Didache. Well, how about why wasn't that accepted? Because it wasn't written by prophets or apostles. You see? So, uh, you see? So that is why, that is why they defended it. So now in 367, Athanasius rose up again to challenge the heretics. He rose up again, over and over and over again, right? And here's what he said, okay? Again, see, he says again. You could tell at this point, he's getting a little bit tired of this. Again, it is not tedious. Oh, okay, maybe he's not getting tired of this. Again, it is not tedious to speak of the books of the New Testament. These are the four gospels, um, according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You notice that it says according to Matthew, according to Matthew. Interesting thing, on the, on the scroll, on the scrolls, that's actually what it is. It is, says according to Matthew. And so he wrote it like word for word. You know, he just didn't say Matthew. Interesting little, little side note, little side note. Okay, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Afterwards, the Acts of the Apostles and epistles called Catholic. Catholic in Greek just means universal or general. They are for everyone, for every church. That's all, all that matters, right? Um, uh, and the epistles called Catholic, seven. Uh, James, one of uh, Peter, two. So two, so first and second Peter. You know, of John, three, first, second, third, John. You see that? After these, one of Jude. In addition, there are 14 epistles of Paul written in this order. The first to the Romans and then two to the Corinthians. After these, to the Galatians, next to the Ephesians, then to the Philippians, then to the Colossians. After these, two to the Thessalonians, and that to the Hebrews, and then again, two to the Timothy, one to the Thomas, and last minute, that to Philemon, and besides the revelation of John. Now, first of all, do you notice a couple things? First of all, you notice his order was different than ours. You notice that? But remember, they just had scrolls in a box. You know, there was no order. The scrolls in a box. You can imagine my shock the first time I went to teach a Russian Bible class, or, you know, to somebody, my wife, with a Russian Bible, and the order of the books was different. I couldn't find anything, you know, right? Because the order doesn't matter, you know. So, you know, our, our, the order of our Bible, it makes sense. But to be honest, the order of the Russian Bible actually makes sense too. The order of the English Bible is not chronological. It's not even close to chronological, you know, but maybe the Russian Bible is. I don't speak Russian, so I don't know. So notice, did you notice though? This is our New Testament. He just went through the 27 books of the New Testament. You see that? And he said that we have always accepted these books. Now, just give me two more minutes, all right? And we are done, okay? Does anybody know, just raise your hand, does anybody know what this is? All right, to be honest, I didn't expect anybody to raise their hand. I actually didn't know it either, um, you know, but I can tell you this, right? I can tell you this, when I change it to English, there's not a soul in this building who doesn't know what this is, right? So let's, let's take a look, let's change this to English, all right? So everybody here will know what this is. Luke 15:3. So he told them this parable. This is Jesus speaking. One man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. 
And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who have no repentance. Now, has it ever, has anybody here ever considered the fact that there has never been 99 sheep? There's never been 99 sheep. Every person on this planet that has ever lived or ever will live is the lost sheep. But some of us, some of those lost sheep, when they heard their loving shepherd call, they went running, they went running to their shepherd and they obeyed him because they loved him. They, they believed, repented, confessed, were baptized, and they continue to obey the writings of the apostles and the prophets because they love their shepherd. And those that have done that, that have believed, confessed, repented, and been baptized, they have been added to the Lord's church, the church of Christ, the church belonging to Christ. And if you're not in the church of Christ, if you're not in the church that belongs to Christ, you're not going to go to heaven, right? Because you're not here. You're not with your shepherd. You're not with your shepherd. So if there's anyone here that wants to make the relationship with God right, why wait? Why wait? Come forward and let's take care of that together as we stand and sing. <laughs>